Being an artist can be draining and exhausting. The nights are long and dark and cold. The road ahead, often uncertain. You've got to keep yourself fueled. You've got to keep gas in the tank. You've got to feed your mind. <laughs> He moved to a shack out on the dunes just south of Bay St. Louis. In the evenings, he'd walk the beach and look out over the gray water where skines of pelicans came laboring down the coast in their slow tandem flights above the offshore swells. Improbable birds. At night, he could see the lights come up along the causeway, lights along the horizon, the slow passing of ships, the distant lights of the drilling rigs. There was cold water from a cistern at the house, but no electricity a small cast iron railroad stove in which he burned driftwood. He'd no money to buy bottled gas for the cook stove, so he cooked on the wood stove as well. Rice and fish, dried apricots. The days cooled and he sat on the beach in the raw wind off the gulf, wrapped in an army blanket and read physics, old poetry. He tried to write letters to her. Where he walked the tide lines at dusk, the last red reaches of the sun flared slowly out along the sky to the west, and the tide pools stood like spills of blood. He stopped to look back at his bare footprints, filling with water one by one. The reefs seemed to move slowly in the last hours, and the late colors of the sun drained away, and then the sudden darkness fell, like a foundry shutting down for the night. At daybreak, he hiked out through the dunes and up to the sandy road to the highway and trudged along the edge of the blacktop looking for dead animals. He skinned them out with a single-edged razor blade and carried the raw, unstretched hides to the little grocery store two miles down the road raccoon and muskrat, once or twice a mink. Nutria tales for the bounty. He bought tea and canned milk with the money, cooking oil, hot sauce, and tinned fruit. He carried home dead rabbits from the road that, he, that had not been there the day before and cooked and ate them. He washed his clothes in the dishpan and hung them to dry over the porch railing. Sometimes they'd blow away down the dunes. On sunny days, he'd walk the beach naked, solitary, silent, lost. Nights he built fires on the beach and sat there wrapped in his blanket. The moon rose over the gulf and the moon's path dished and tiled on the water. Birds flew down the beach in the dark. He didn't know what kind they were. He thought about the passenger, but he never went back out to the islands. The fire leaned in the wind and seawater hissed in the burning wood. He watched it burn to coals. The embers glowed and faded and glowed and bits of fire hobbled away down the beach into the darkness. He knew that he should wonder what was to become of him. That's from The Passenger by Cormac McCarthy. Cormac is probably my all-time favorite author. I'm not alone. I think he is the modern literary master. I like that little section in his latest book, like I like many sections, it's, it's cinematic. It, every sentence is an image, it's, it's, it's so vivid. Cormac has such a command of language. I'm kind of flabbergasted by it. The Passenger is about Bobby Western, who is working as a salvage diver, but he's more than that. He's a scientist, a physicist. He was a race car driver. He, uh, his father was sort of famous, helped develop the atomic bomb. His sister <laughs> was a staggering genius, also a, a physicist, a mathematician. Uh, she's dead, spoiler alert. <laughs> they get right into that at the beginning of the book. Uh, Bobby may be in love with her. It's complicated. <laughs> Cormac's books are complicated. I think, uh, you know, a lot of you watching this channel are photographers, storytellers. I like to read Cormac. It 
it, it fills my tank. It, it inspires me. I've read this book in December. I finished it in December. I can't stop thinking about it. I'm going to read it again probably in a few months. It's, it, it's bouncing around in my head. It's, it's so complex. As, as Bobby wanders around and tries to figure out what to do with his life, there are some shadowy, perhaps government figures chasing him. Um, the book is set in 1980 in and around New Orleans in the South, although it diverges and goes other places as things happen to Bobby. I highly recommend the works of Cormac McCarthy if you haven't uh, if you haven't ever read one. They're they're not easily digestible books. You hear the language; it's it's uh, nobody writes like Cormac. He'll have whole paragraphs without any punctuation often. Um, people's uh, dialogue doesn't get quotations. Sentences flow together, but it all sort of makes sense, and he describes things oftentimes using words and phrases and descriptions that you don't really even understand, but on some primordial deep level you do. Uh, Cormac's written a lot of books. Um, he did write the novel that No Country for Old Men was adapted to, which is an Oscar-winning film, one of my favorite films actually of all time, probably in my top five for sure. I love that film. Uh, They've adapted a few of his works into movies. Um, All the Pretty Horses, The Road. The last thing that he wrote before this was a screenplay that he just showed up with and handed to Ridley Scott, and that is The uh, the Counselor, which is a, a movie that I'd like to revisit. I have the screenplay on my iPad, and there are sections of the screenplay that I will read repeatedly. Um... There's another book of his, part of the trilogy, the Border Trilogy, uh, Cities of the Plain, that I also have on my iPad. And there's a section near the end of that where the protagonist and the antagonist have a, a knife fight to the death in an alley. And it's absolutely brutal as, as the antagonist, who's a pimp, is antagonizing the protagonist. A lot of ists here. I'm not as good a writer as Cormac. Um, it's, it's incredible. Both these men know that one of them is going to die. Read some Cormac McCarthy. That's all I've got to say. Now there's a companion to this novel that came out a month or so later, and it's called, uh, Stella Maris, I think. It's all, it's about Bobby Western's sister, and it's basically transcripts or I think it's transcripts. It's tr it's transcripts of her right before she died. She had checked herself into a mental hospital, and it's conversations between her and a therapist in this mental hospital, and uh, <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> you got to read a second though. You read this, then you read that. And then I'm going to go back and read both of them again because I cannot stop thinking about them. This is how I fill my tank. I read books. The Raw Society. I heard about this um, on Dan Milner's YouTube channel. Uh, he had just very briefly in passing mentioned this, and I was intrigued, and so I, I bought it. I found the website, and I ordered it, and a week later or so it came in the mail. It's a magazine. It's the first issue of a magazine. Uh, what they say here is, To the readers of the magazine, you're about to explore the stories of photographers and writers who are not trying to tell you exactly what to think, but rather encouraging you to exhibit our most basic human trait, the act of thinking critically. Yes, think critically. Question everything. This book is awesome. There's, uh, I don't know, a dozen... More than a dozen, 12 or 15 little articles uh, with stories, interviews, and photographs from different photographers. Dan Milner is actually one of the last stories in here. I read that. I'm about halfway through this thing. I'll you know read an article every few days before 
bedtime. It's, it's a, it sits on my nightstand. I'm slowly weeding my way through it. I'm not in a hurry. I'll get through it. It's absolutely fascinating. Uh, let me read you a section here. This is a, a chapter about photographer Jose Manuel Navia, who is a Spanish photographer born in Madrid in 1957. They've got a, uh, a bunch of photographs from this guy and a pretty great little article. The interviewer asks him, do you think there's a difference between seeing and looking? Navia says, I think so. In photography, we talk a lot about the gaze, about vision. There are people who have a photographic gaze or vision and others who do not, or at least find it very difficult. That's how it is. And there are also times when any of us can look a lot and see nothing, and other times when it seems that the world reveals itself to us. And where, and where we did not see anything, we begin to see, and the vision seems to expand. We still see unintentionally, but looking requires an intention. Yes, looking requires an intention. Art requires intention. As well as a sense of play. Anyways, check out the Raw Society. I highly recommend it if you want something to read to, to uh, help your brain, make you think about things, see some wonderful photography. There are two, two of the articles that I've read which really stand out for me. There's one on the American South and then um, just some amazing photography. And then by, I should tell you who did that amazing photography because it really is stunning. Uh, let me see here, because it doesn't say in the contents. Uh, photographs by Micah Green. Writing by Kayla Green. There must be a relation there. But the photographs are amazing. And then the very next article is... The Remote Territories. Writing and photographs by Samuel Aranda. These photographs are black and white film. Maybe... Um, are these square? I'm kind of obsessed. No, they're not square. They're, they look like four by three. I'm kind of obsessed with square lately because I'm thinking about getting a Hasselblad film camera. Anyways, um, homeboy Samuel Aranda traveled around remote territories of uh, French islands of Bretagne, Bret Breta Bretagne. I, I'm freaking American. I can't pronounce these French words. Uh, here on the French islands of Bretagne, they call us those from the continent. Anyways, he cruises around these islands, takes a bunch of pictures, and talks about it. And it's absolutely fascinating. Anyways, check out the Raw Society. Feed your mind. And... Last but not least, The Creative Act, A Way of Being by Rick Rubin. Of course you know who Rick Rubin is. Perhaps one of the most famous record producers of all time. Beastie Boys, Run DMC, Slayer, uh, Tom Petty, Johnny Cash, Audio Slave. Uh, guaranteed half the music you like was produced by Rick Rubin. He's a genius. I'm a, I'm, I'm a little bit obsessed with Rick Rubin. He put out this book just at the end of last year, The Creative Act, A Way of Being. And I'm working my way through this too. It's on the nightstand. Uh, I'm not reading it in a hurry. I'll read a chapter or two a night and then I think about it and then I go to sleep. My phone was ringing. Living life as an artist is a practice. You are either engaging in the practice or you're not. It makes no sense to say you're not good at it. It's like saying I'm not good at being a monk. You're either living as a monk or you're not. We tend to think of the artist's work as the output. The real work of the artist is a way of being in the world. Yes, Mr. Rubin. Yes, sir. Self-doubt. This is a chapter on self-doubt. Self-doubt lives in all of us. And while we may wish it gone, it is there to serve us. Flaws are human, and the attraction of art is that humanity and the attraction of art is the humanity held in it. 
If we were machine-like, the art wouldn't resonate. It would be soulless. With life comes pain, insecurity, and fear. We're all different and we're all imperfect, and the imperfections are what makes each of us and our work interesting. We create pieces reflective of who we are, and if insecurity is part of who we are, then our work will have a greater degree of truth in it as a result. I like that. Making, the making of art is not a competitive act. Our work is representative of the self. You would be amiss to say, I'm not up to the challenge. Yes, you may need to deepen your craft to fully realize your vision. If you're not up to it, no one else can do it. Only you can. You're the only one with your voice. <laughs> yes, Rick knows what's up. Talk about, uh, rereading this book, it just reinforces the need for uh, embracing your flaws, embracing the process, embracing the insecurity, embracing your authenticity, not trying to be anything that you're not, not trying to be anyone else. Just stay true to yourself. Do what you need to do. Find your path. This book is essential. This is a book that I'll probably have in my nightstand for a long time, and I'll be opening and reading when I need a little bit of wisdom. I need a little bit of support. I need a little bit of help from Rick Rubin. There is a lifetime of knowledge and wisdom inside this book, and I can't recommend it enough. At the beginning of every chapter, there's like a little kind of couple line poem thing. I don't know what you would call it. Beware of the assumption that the way you work is the best way, simply because it's the way you've done it before. <sighs> Man, I could go on all day. Do what you can with what you have. Nothing more is needed. I think I've said that before on the channel. Rick knows what's up. Staying in it. This is the very next chapter. The artist's job is never truly finished. In many occupations, when we go home, we leave our work behind at the office. The artist is always on call. Even after we get up from hours engaged in our craft, the clock is still running. This is because the artist's job is of two kinds, the work of doing, the work of being. Creativity is something you are, not only something you do. It's a way of moving through the world. Every minute, every day, if you're not driven to an unrealistic standard of dedication, it may not be the path for you. So much of the artist's work is about balance, so it's ironic that this way of life leaves little room for it. Isn't that the truth? That's the yin and yang of life. Anyways, check out this book wherever books are sold. I, yes, I read books on my iPad, but I like an analog book. I like to hold it. I like it to be a thing. There's even a water stain on this. I don't know what happened, but I keep a glass of water next to my bed. Maybe that's where that came from. That's kind of a bummer. I like to keep my books in good shape, but uh, that's what happens. I also just like a real book. I'm gonna have this forever. I highly recommend it. Go to the bookstore, get a book, get the passenger, order the Raw Society online, find the creative act, a way of being. That's it, that's the episode. I'll be back with some more photography pretty soon. Uh, it's been raining a lot here in California, so I haven't been outside as much. I've been doing a lot of analog photography. I've been doing a lot of filmmaking. I've got a bit of work coming up that's gonna keep me occupied for a while, but uh, I do have some things in the works. I'm making a couple short films. I'm directing a music video in about, what's today? Uh, today is Tuesday. I don't know, in a week and a half or so, I'm directing a music video. I'm also in rehearsals for uh, an experimental short film. I've got some other things that I'm writing, have written, are in various processes, just artist life, just trying to do work, trying to tell stories, trying to make things, trying to express myself, trying to move through the world and stay sane, still make a living, put out some videos for y'all occasionally. I appreciate you showing up. Uh, if you liked this video, if, you, if it was helpful, if you enjoyed it, if you want to see more like this, let me know in the comments below. I think I am going to be talking occasionally a little more uh, along these lines about 
what I'm doing to stay inspired, how I'm feeding my mind, because it's absolutely essential as an artist. You've got to, you've got to have an input. You've got to be putting things in you. I thought I was ending this video. Now I'm rambling again. Anyways, if you wouldn't mind, leave me a comment. Let me know what you thought of this. If you've read these books, uh, recommend some books to me and uh, give it a like, give it a subscribe if you've, uh, if this is your first time and we'll see you very soon for some form of photographic adventure. Get out there and make something, folks. Thanks for watching. We'll see you soon.